Let's talk about pain, a podcast from the Quebec Pain Research Network. In each episode, we discuss the latest advances in pain research with guests from across Quebec in the health and research communities. Enjoy your listening. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to this new episode of Let's Talk About Pain. I'm Masume Raimi, working under supervision of Professor Matthew Pichet. In this episode, I'm thrilled to present to you Dr. Pichet and delve into his research endeavors and aspirations in the field of pain. Hello, Dr. Pichet. First of all, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, uh, Masume. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I'm a professor uh, at the Department of Anatomy uh, at Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières. Um, initially, I was uh, trained as a chiropractor. Uh, in the same university, and then I went to uh, do a master's of cell biology and biophysics. Uh, I was interested in brain plasticity at the time. Brain plasticity means the brain's ability to change and adapt by forming new connections between neurons, allowing us to learn and develop throughout our lives. Then I switched to uh, University of Montreal, and I did a PhD in neurological science. Uh, and later I went to uh, Japan in Tokyo uh, to conduct uh, neurophysiology research uh, for my postdoc. Nice. Okay, when and in what area of study did you start your career? Uh, so I started in 2002 with my master's. Uh, I was working with uh, Professor Branchti at the time. Uh, and we were interested in uh, brain plasticity in uh, visually deprived uh, animal models. A sensory deprived animal model is an animal that has been kept in an environment where it cannot see, hear, or feel things normally, helping scientists study how lack of sensory input affect the brain and behavior. Uh, so I was using mice and rats at the time. Could you tell us what influenced you the most in deciding to be a pain researcher? Um, I would say there are <clears throat> two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I practiced for a few years uh, before dedicating myself full-time to research. And uh, as a chiropractor, I was uh, seeing patients with uh, acute and chronic pain. And uh, for the same conditions, uh, different patients would react differently to the treatment and they would have different um, different path uh, for their clinical evolution. So I was kind of wondering why it was different between people. Um, so this is one, one of the things that motivated uh, my interest for pain research. I had these kind of questions, clinically speaking. Um, and also during my undergraduate uh, studies, I was exposed to, uh, I went to scientific meetings and I was exposed to pain research and I met really interesting people and I heard great talks uh, and the methods they were using were fascinating to me, uh, including uh, brain imaging and uh, neurophysiology, electrophysiology. Electrophysiology is the study of how electricity flows through the cells in our body, helping us understand how our nerves and muscles work. So, um, yeah, I decided to start uh, with uh, neuroscience more generally, and then I switched to pain research. We would like to know more about your laboratory and your team. Could you please uh, provide us some information in this regard? Um, yeah, um, so first of all, um, I would say it's uh, maybe a bit unusual lab. Like we have, uh, we conduct translational pain research, so uh, the questions are, are quite broad. Um, we have one section for animal research and one section for uh, human research, including clinical uh, population uh, coming to the lab. Uh, clinical population mostly with uh, chronic pain. Uh, 
So we use different methods. Uh, the central method, I would say, is electrophysiology uh, from animal to human. Uh, so single cell recording, uh, for example, in, in animals and electrophysiology, like EEG methods uh, in human. EEG or electroencephalogram is a test that measures the electrical activity in your brain using small sensors placed on your scalp. At the moment, my team is uh, composed of approximately 20 students. Uh, this includes uh, students from very different countries and background. Uh, some of them are uh, basic scientists, others are uh, clinical scientists, um, masters, PhD, postdocs. I think it's quite interesting to see the, the different backgrounds. Uh, they all have their um, different view on pain and pain research. Uh, so I have, uh, for example, a dentist, uh, a psychologist, uh, uh, a veterinary medicine doctor, um, chiropractor. Um, so they all have their own view, and this influences uh, the way uh, they want to conduct their research. Um, so this is, I think, quite uh, interesting. And the interactions between uh, the students make, makes it very interesting. Nice. I think you have interesting environment and atmosphere in your lab. Okay, when the idea of becoming a pain scientist came to your mind for the first time? Um, at the beginning, I was not uh, sure about uh, pain research itself. I was really interested by uh, neurophysiology. So in my undergraduate studies, I was already reading uh, scientific articles on uh, neurophysiology, and it really sparked uh, an interest for me. Uh, and then I think later on when I was uh, in my practice as a chiropractor, um, pain came as a really important topic for me, and I decided to go to pain research. What is your research line and what are your ongoing projects? Um, okay, so like I said, uh, we have uh, a lab with animal studies and, and human studies. So we have different lines of research. Um, my research program in general uh, is on uh, pain perception, pain regulation, uh, trying to understand the mechanisms uh, in basic studies, but also the pathological mechanisms of chronic pain. Uh, we do that in both animals and, uh, uh, and humans. Uh, so one of the, one of the line of research uh, is uh, more basic, I would say. Um, we're trying to understand the mechanisms of hypersensitivity to different uh, noxious stimuli, uh, mechanical or thermal stimuli. Uh, we can see a parallel uh, between, uh, for example, different animal models, uh, including uh, one model that we developed as a chronic back pain model. And also we see similar behavioral effects uh, uh, in animals uh, with um, uh, visual deprivation, different models of visual deprivation. Both models or the different models, they show hypersensitivity to mechanical and thermal stimuli. So we're trying to understand the mechanisms of this hypersensitivity, um, which uh, is close to, in some cases, uh, what we see in patients with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So this is one, one line of research. Uh, another line of research, uh, which is also basic science, but I would say applied science, uh, is uh, in human, uh, in which we're looking at the interaction between pain and cognition. Cognition in neuroscience refers to the study of how our brains think, remember, and make decisions. So different processes of uh, uh, cognitive functions. Um, the purpose of this line of research is uh, to try to see uh, how the brain can inhibit pain when we engage into a cognitive task. Cognitive tasks are those undertakings that require a person to mentally process new information and allow them to recall, retrieve that information from memory, and to use that information at a later time in the same or similar situation. Or the opposite, when 
Uh, pain disrupts uh, cognition if pain is too salient or too uh, important for someone. Um, of course, this will lead to uh, clinical research eventually, uh, as you can imagine. And finally, maybe uh, another line of research uh, that is important for us is um, it's a, a translational approach in which we're looking at uh, the mechanisms of spinal manipulation uh, uh, to relieve pain uh, in patients with chronic uh, primary low back pain or uh, animal models of chronic back pain. Uh, so uh, we have uh, clinical protocols and we uh, we conduct uh, mechanical, uh, not mechanical, but uh, uh, mechanistic uh, studies to really try to understand what changes in the nervous system when pain is uh, relieved. Mm-hmm. Until now, I found you do a lot of things, teaching, management, meetings, travels, and consulting. How do you manage all your activities, and what does a work day look like for a researcher? Um, I think it really depends on uh, your uh, career advancement. Uh, so I would say it has changed a lot uh, since the beginning of my career. Um, I started in 2009 as a professor here at uh, UQTR. Uh, at that time, I had very few students, and uh, I was really in the lab, and I was doing experiments with them, um, training them uh, with every detail, um, little by little, the lab grew, and uh, I had more students and some senior students that could help me to train the younger students. Uh, so little by little, I, ga- I, I got further from the lab and closer to my office. Um, so I think it changes with time uh, during your career. Nowadays, I would say that uh, I, I spend most of my time doing supervision, I don't do research myself anymore. I supervise students to do it. Uh, so this is an important part of my uh, my research time. Uh, I, I still run statistics on the data when we write papers together, uh, but that's the only analysis part that I do most of the time. Uh, otherwise, I have a lot of writing to do. Uh, I write uh, grant applications, Uh, scientific articles. Um, I also do a lot of evaluations, uh, scientific evaluations. For example, I evaluate uh, scientific articles that have been submitted to uh, scientific journals. Uh, I also evaluate grant applications from um, other researchers. So my tasks are quite varied, and uh, this is one of the things that I like. And I also uh, have to travel uh, to go to scientific meetings or collaborate uh, uh, with my colleagues abroad in Japan, Europe, um, United States. So this is uh, in- interesting. <laughs> yep. As I guess you have lots of things to do and you are really busy. Okay, what do you consider as your most important <coughs> studies and contribution to the pain research? Um. That's a good question. Um, uh, we do a lot of different types of research, so I can probably summarize into uh, four different lines of uh, research that led to contributions that I think are um, original to my lab. Um, the first one is the development of a animal model of chronic back pain uh, and uh, animal models of visual deprivation Uh, These models together allow us to uh, investigate the mechanisms of hypersensitivity. Um, Both types of models uh, have similarities, and I think uh, they help us to understand what leads to uh, hypersensitivity in these animals, which corresponds to um, hyperalgesia or hypersensitivity to pain uh, in humans. Uh, so our previous work on these topics uh, was quite original, and we'll keep going on <laughs> on this line of research. Another aspect is, uh, I would say, uh, quite unique to our lab, um, uh, translational research uh, with uh, chiropractic um, interventions. Uh, we developed an animal model of back pain that we can use to study uh, the pain relief by chiropractic 
Uh, of course, we adapt the chiropractic treatment to, to the animal model, but this has been validated. Um, so we can study how pain or uh, pain behaviors are relieved in the animal um, uh, with chiropractic treatments. Uh, and we look at the same uh, in human, uh, in patients with chronic low back pain. And we can really get access to different types of mechanisms because in animals we have, uh, we can use um, uh, invasive methods. And so we can answer different questions. And in human, it is really close to the clinical practice. So combined together, we have a really unique uh, generation of knowledge and understanding of uh, pain relief uh, with neurophysiological, uh, with a neurophysiological approach. Um, in my early work, I also conducted original research on uh, pain regulation mechanisms. Uh, so we could look at cerebrospinal pain regulation mechanisms using uh, brain imaging methods and uh, nociceptive flexion reflex recordings. The nociceptive flexion reflex or NFR has been proposed as a reproducible neurophysiological tool for the evaluation of nociception. The NFR is a reflex that facilitates the withdrawal of an affected body region in response to noxious stimulation. Uh, so this really allowed us, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, in different uh, interventions to see how the brain and the spinal cord uh, interact during pain regulation. Uh, it was done in the animals before, but uh, in human it was difficult. So this was uh, quite original research that I conducted with Pierre Rainville from the uh, University of Montreal, who was my supervisor at the time, and my dear colleague, Mathieu Roy, who is now a professor at uh, McGill, who was a PhD student with me. And finally, I think uh, we are one of the only lab looking at uh, neurovascular coupling uh, in the spinal cord during uh, nociceptive processing. So this means uh, when we stimulate uh, an animal uh, body part, including the hind paw, for example, uh, we can record uh, neuronal activity in the spinal cord and uh, vascular changes, and we can see how they are related. Uh, this is very important uh, for pain research using um, in human using fMRI. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, measures the small changes in blood flow that occur with brain activity. It can help us see which parts of the brain are doing important tasks and check how stroke or other illnesses affect them. Uh, this is really the basis. Uh, we have to understand this relationship to run proper analyses and uh, really infer proper mechanisms uh, in humans. So I think yeah, these, these are four important co contributions. Interesting. Uh, and also we would like to know what is the most important scientific question you would like to answer or the biggest challenge you would like to overcome. I will not be very original, uh, but maybe the approach would be <laughs> later. Uh, I think the most important question uh, would be how to prevent and reverse uh, chronic pain. Uh, in my case, uh, I would be interested to do that with uh, non-pharmacological interventions. Um, these include chiropractic, of course, because of my training and some of the students working in my lab. But I'm also interested in using uh, and developing or optimizing a uh, cognitive-based approach. And uh, we started to work recently with a collaborator in California uh, using um, pain reprocessing therapy. So these are avenues that I would like to um, investigate in the future uh, to really try to prevent or reverse chronic, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Because chronic pain is a, the challenge <laughs> that we uh, all want to overcome, I guess. Okay, I think most of our audience like to know the answer of next question. How do you think your research could have a positive impact on the lives of people living with pain? Yeah, this is a very important question. <clears throat> um, so first, I think uh, it's difficult sometimes uh, for people to understand why we conduct basic science research. Uh, um, 
So in our case, we are trying to understand the pain mechanisms. And if we understand the pain mechanisms uh, better, uh, we can design uh, intervention to help people uh, have less pain or to prevent people develop chronic pain. If we don't understand the mechanisms of pain and chronic pain, it's impossible to do that. So in the way the basic science that we conduct in my lab, the research uh, contributes to that. Uh, secondly, I would say, um, if I think about the clinical research uh, that we conduct, uh, we can say that we are validating um, existing approaches to, to prevent or treat chronic pain, but we can also optimize, uh, improve uh, the interventions that we use or even target specific subpopulations of patients with chronic pain. So generally, I think um, the impact of our research is really to help people manage their pain better. If you could choose the next question, what would it be? And what would be your answer? Um, on the basis of um, the kind of work that we are currently conducting, in about five to ten years, I think, uh, we will be able to try to see if we can reduce pain in patients with chronic pain or even relieve it um, using cognitive-based intervention uh, that will be based on our findings that we are currently collecting, um, generating. Um, so my question is really to see if uh, cognitive-based intervention can prevent or reverse chronic pain, uh, and this intervention would be designed on our current findings. Um, so, for example, uh, we want to look at this into, in patients with chronic pain, but also in patients, uh, uh, or uh, not patients, but normal individuals with uh, uh, advanced age, aging, uh, who have uh, decreasing cognitive abilities. Um, so we can look at the pain cognition interactions uh, in these patients and, and see if the methods that we develop based on the mechanisms that we found can be useful for them. Nice so the answer I can't tell right now, uh, but uh, probably in the future we can say, yes, uh, these interventions are helpful. Thank you very much, Dr. Pichet, for taking the time to engage this captivating conversation. I would l also like to express my sincere appreciation to our esteemed partners, the Quebec Pain Research Network and the Quebec Chronic Pain Association. As we conclude this episode, I hope you found it both informative and enjoyable, and I look forward to welcoming you back soon for another interesting episode. Thank you for listening to Let's Talk About Pain. Don't hesitate to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and to share the podcast with your friends. For more information, visit our website at qprn.ca or our YouTube channel by searching Quebec Pain Research Network. See you next time.